What's up to all my product founders and creatives out there? This is your host, Lisa Montero, and you're listening to the Visual Commerce Podcast, where founders, creatives, and brand leaders bring you insights on how to tell better visual stories of your product in three, two, one. We are here with Zoe Dove Manny, solo brand strategist and designer. Zoe, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So you caught my attention specifically because you have both a brand strategist and design background, and you've been working in and around brands for about 10 years. And right now we're in a spot where so many creative and strategy roles are merged together. So if someone is launching a product, it's almost difficult to decipher what role they should even be looking for to help them, whether that's developing their brand story or how that gets relayed into their visual narrative. Are they looking for a creative director, or a graphic designer? storyteller, or are they looking for one person or four people? And what I appreciated about our conversation is understanding the outputs of what we're really looking for from these different roles and how that helps a company gauge the skill sets and who they really need um, to hire once they understand that uh, deliverable. Mm -hmm. So when you and I got to talking, hearing you explain the role of brand strategist was super helpful in providing clarity for what someone entering into CPG and playing strongly in visual commerce should be looking for. So Zoe, could you first clarify what people should expect from the role of a brand strategist and separately what they should expect from the role of a designer? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you asked. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a strategist. So a strategist, a brand strategist is there to craft the overall story of a brand, um, starting with why the founder even started this company in the first place. And so the brand strategist is going to create things like positioning, um, brand voice. They'll, they might do some research, a competitor analysis. They'll do, they'll map out the customer journey and they'll dig into your brand persona and just figure out who, who are you making this for and what resonates with them about it. A designer is going to take all of those tools and create the look and feel of the brand. So the designer, the brand designer is going to make your actual logo and your colors and textures and figure out what style of photography you want to use. Okay. That makes sense. And then what do you think the common misconceptions then are the role of a brand strategist and separately the misconceptions of the role of a designer? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the reason I became a brand strategist is because as a designer, I felt limited in how much I could help my clients. Um, so I think, I think a lot of companies are, are self-diagnosing and they're not doing it all that well when they're hiring a designer. So a really good example is something that I lived, which is when I worked for this wine company and they needed, um, they were creating a loyalty program. And, you know, they had like a tiered system and they asked me to create badges for their loyalty program on their landing page for it. And it was essentially like little logos for each of the tiers. And it was like a wall of text. And it was so, it was like detective work trying to figure out like, what is the difference between these different tiers of the loyalty program? And what are you getting when you buy it? And I was like, yeah, you know, I can make you these little badges for your loyalty program, but I don't think it's going to really increase your sales all that much. And as a strategist, a strategist would look at that same page and, um, and say like, look, your, your language, your messaging is off. And that's what's giving you such a bad bounce rate with this. And we need to look at the overall goal of what, what you're trying to achieve here and, what we need to communicate, and then we'll figure out what tools we need. And that's when the designer comes in and, and will create your badges or your, you know, maybe, maybe you'll do like a whole new site. Absolutely. That makes sense. And it, it helps to understand why you would couple those two things together. It's naturally helps you just give people a better idea of what a better investment looks like in that. Like you were saying, I know when we had talked, like, someone comes to you saying, Hey, I need a flyer or I need a video. Well, is that really what they need? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, is that where your audience is? Are they going to be looking at videos? What if your audience is 
60 and over. Maybe they're not looking at videos. Maybe they're looking in, in newspapers, right? So you have to think about where you're reaching these people and what medium you're using. Now, when you and I talked, one of the de deliverables you mentioned as a brand strategist is creating a roadmap for the brands you work with. Can you unpack a little bit about what goes into creating this guide? Yeah. So the roadmap is a document that um, it, it, it breaks down the customer journey all the way from um, awareness through conversion to advocacy. Um, it breaks down your brand persona, who, who they are, what do they look like? What are they buying? Where are they, what world are they living in? Um, it gives you positioning, um, a brand voice, competitor analysis, and your high level messaging. And ultimately the, the big thing is like the why it's, it's, um, a lot of people know of this one, this one video by Simon Sinek about why he says like, he says, people don't buy what you're making. They buy, they buy why you're making it. So mm -hmm. the, the purpose of this document is to just really dig deep and, and figure out your why. And so you can then use this brand uh, roadmap as a tool to make future decisions about um, copy, design, or videos, content strategy. You can use the document, you can use the roadmap, like when you hire a designer, for example, you can give them this and they can use that to create what they're making um, just to make sure that everything is kind of under the same umbrella. Absolutely. I love that. And I just want to drive that point home of you saying like this document helps to filter the decision making and it, because it helps set the tone for the entire brand and not having thought through these elements would make it difficult later if you're trying to relay authentic or authenticity through a cohesive visual story. So it's oh, a process. Yeah. This is the starting point that I think some people just kind of coming into the CPG world and just trying to quickly come up with all the trends and try to like just make it might miss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can, you can also use it for, um, for onboarding, which I think is a really tough thing for a lot of founders that I've spoken to is like, they're so busy that by the time that they are hiring someone, they are just in the weeds, right? And so when they bring someone in new, a new person in, they don't have time to sit down and have a heart to heart with them about why they're doing this business. What they're, instead, it's like, oh my God, can you please help us with this like data entry or whatever it is? And you know, you obviously like you want your employees to care about, about your company. And so with something like this, they can take a look at it and they can really get it. Absolutely. And now another document you had talked about creating after you do this four week process of creating a roadmap um, is the visual identity kit. Can you discuss in like kind of in depth what is even involved in creating that? Yeah. So the main framework of the visual identity kit, it's, it's basically, it's just like your, your, your brand guide is what a lot of companies call it. Um, and it, it's got all the little pieces that any future designer needs to make any of your future marketing pieces. So it's got a, what I call a brandscape in it, which is just kind of like an overall like image of just kind of the look and feel of your brand. Um, it's got a logo, secondary logos, colors, textures, fonts, suggested photography, and then do's and don'ts for, for selecting photography. So we have a visitor here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the cat wants to be in. <laughs> yeah. And, and he's, he's not taking no for an answer. So, <laughs> um, so you, uh, so, so those are all the things that are in the visual identity kit. What goes into it is looking at the strategy roadmap or looking at maybe strategy that somebody else has done before you and mapping out all those things into, into visuals. Um, and, and all these things, it, it, it becomes like a toolkit so that you can then, you know, you can, after that, you can build your website, you can build your Instagram presence, um, any little thing like flyers or like merch, anything that is any visual, like a business card, um, you use this to make sure that all that stuff looks consistent. And now... So one of the subheads I know that you had mentioned in this kit is like brand attributes. So 
how do you make decisions on like subjective elements on what a visual voice looks like? For example, if someone's like, if the brand attribute is keen and bold, similar to the example you had shown me, how do you really determine what bold might look like to one person versus the other? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, um, and, and something I've, a skill that I've developed over the years, you know, I mean, bold to one person is not necessarily bold to another person, right? So we look at a few things. So first, I kind of compare, I look at comparisons of other similar brands that my client and I both feel that they, uh, that they have a bold feeling about them. And so I'll look at, well, what colors are they using? What fonts are they looking, what fonts are they using? Um, what kind of photography are they using? Even what kind of messaging they have. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll basically just make a big Pinterest board uh, for my client of stuff that stuff that I think is bold, stuff that I think fits in their realm of of what they're trying to communicate conceptually, and stuff that maybe they won't like or maybe doesn't fit. And it really just gives us something to look at and something to, it's, it's just like a jumping off point for a conversation. And so we'll, we'll look at, you know, we might, I'll I'll ask them, you know, do, do any of these pieces feel like really right to you or do any of these pieces feel really wrong to you? And then they'll pick out one or two of them and then we'll look really closely at them and, I'll, well, I'll pick it apart. I'll say like, okay, well, how do you feel about these colors? How do you feel about this line? How do you feel about the the line weight or the line texture of this? How do you feel about this like collage aspect or this duotone aspect? And it, I find it so helpful because, and, and I, I know my clients do too, because, you know, if you're not living and breathing branding, you, you don't necessarily speak the language. And um, people can feel intimidated yeah. by that or just like lost and just kind of not have the words. So I try my best to give them the language to, to tell me what they need. And I love that exercise. And I think that's, that's helpful for any company. If you're going, I want to be defined by X, Y, and Z, put together a Pinterest board, put together images that have that meaning to you and start there. I love that exercise. Mm-hmm. It's also a great way if you're if you're hiring designers and you don't have, you know, a creative director to to manage that relationship. It's it's really good to to just make a Pinterest board and show some examples of what you like and what you don't like, and but also make sure you talk about it with the designer about well what aspects of it do you like and not like, and that can really speed up the process of working with a designer because sometimes a designer is you know. They'll make something based on what you what you sent them, but it's and then you're like, well, I like this part of it, but I don't like that part of it. So if you could have as many of those conversations up front, the faster the process is going to be for everyone. And and you're nodding and smiling, and I'm sure that as a <laughs> as a <laughs> visual <laughs> creator, you have um, you know you've lived that too. And even so, I guess to speak to that, then why? From your perspective, would you say it's important to include pages on this document of like photography do's and don'ts? Yeah. So um, any brand is, most brands want photography, right? Um, Photography is an excellent communication tool. Um, We as strategists, photographers, designers, like we're very sensitive and aware of what certain photos are communicating, but maybe not everybody is. And so we need to kind of help, help our clients use that tool to their best advantage. So, um, for example, if, let's see, if you have a brand, if you have a brand that you really want to convey, um, like a, like a, a casual atmosphere or a casual vibe, if you want to attract a client who's not fussy, then you want to make sure that all of the people in your photography are dressed in a non-fussy way so that your ideal client resonates with that person. Absolutely. And I think almost to speak to that and to the word, the word quality then, and almost encompasses brand cohesion as well. Like you can have a really high quality photo or really cool photo, but if it's not fitting in with that story, then it doesn't make sense. 
Exactly. Or things like, you know, maybe, maybe stylistically, maybe one, maybe you wanted a lot of photos that have like really harsh shadows and bright, bright flash. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that's consistent across the board so that you don't have some photos like that. And then some other photos that are like more kind of like soft and fuzzy. And then it just sort of feels like it's not deliberate and it's not really cohesive or, or not really like like giving a, a vibe that, 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 that means something and really like lands with your customer. Absolutely. And I have met a lot of CPG founders that are in the process of getting their product from a manufacturer. So they don't have real photography of the product itself. And that, that seems to be especially an especially common problem during COVID time right Mm. now. And you had mentioned a brand that you were working with didn't have their product complete yet. So they didn't have the visual content to show up the product themselves, but you would still advise them to just start posting anyway. Mm-hmm. What, why did you advise them like that? What would they start even posting if they didn't have photos of the product? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. So, well, so first of all, I do want to mention that it is possible to get renderings of your, of your packages done. Um, but that can, that can be um, cost prohibitive or, Sometimes like just it, it's just not in the cards for the way that everything is fitting together, right? So to, to answer your question, um, I advised a client to do this recently. They were a wine brand and um, they, they, they didn't have, they didn't even have their wine yet. <laughs> I mean, like they didn't have <laughs> bottles, they didn't have labels, they didn't have anything. And they weren't really ready to, you know, they said to me, like, I, I, we don't want to start our Instagram until we have something to actually show. And I strongly discouraged from, from them from doing that because I said, you know, if you don't have an audience first, but you have this great product, well, who's going to buy it? Who are you going to sell it to? <laughs> so you, you mm-hmm. want to build up your audience first. Now, what are you going to post if you don't have photos of your product? Um, that's where I would say a brand, you know, your brand is so much more than your product. It's what you value and it's what, what values resonate with your audience. So for example, with this brand, um, one of their big values was just educating average drinkers, not even wine drinkers, but just average drinkers about wine in a fun, Uh no pressure way. Cause we all know wine can be a little like esoteric. Um, and they, so they made, we, we came up with some ideas for content, a video series called the, uh, WTF series. And it, you know, it was just Mm -hmm. question. It was, they made it in Canva. They, They did it themselves. Um, it was like text on the screen. WT- mm-hmm. WTF is fill in the blank. It would be some kind of basic wine term like terroir or WTF is corked wine mm-hmm. or WTF is biodynamic wine. And so each of these would be a separate video. They would post separately. State the question. It would, it would be like a, you know, a visual of the question on the screen. And then it would be um, the, the, the wine producer herself answering the question in a, you know, no jargon, like easily relatable, fun way, wearing casual clothing, you know, um, no, no blazers anywhere. (laughs) So that was, that was one of the things they did. Um, another big value of theirs was sustainability. They also, uh, they also started a Patreon and this was super cool. Like they decided we came up with this, with these ideas together. It's like, well, how can you how can you even tie in like your rewards for your, um, your, your Patreon patrons? Like how can you tie in your rewards for them to your brand as well? Well, so they know that they care about sustainability. They know that their ideal client cares about sustainability. So donors of a certain tier on Patreon, they will do a beach cleanup in your name. And so they'll film it and they'll go, they live in New Zealand next to all these beautiful beaches and they'll go and fi- they'll film their beach cleanup and they'll show their haul <laughs> of all the garbage they found on the beach. And then they'll tag you <laughs> and say like, you know, thank you for, thank you for, for supporting us. Um, entertainment was another one there. So they were posting memes. Um, and then transparency was a big one for them. So they posted a lot of videos of themselves and just behind the scenes stuff of like, 
this is something like the sharing their struggles of how hard it is to start a company, a wine company specifically. Uh-huh. Um, and we had decided, you know, this is going to be, you, you, this is kind of another conversation, but like how much of your brand do you want to just feature your face? Like how much of your brand is you? How much do you want to have yeah. y- your face on stuff and your voice? Um, and for them, it was mm-hmm. a lot. <laughs> so they did a lot of, you know, they're doing a lot of videos and, and photos featuring themselves in wine related stuff, like going to, you know, going to vineyards or tasting different things or, um, I, I don't know, you know, things wine people do, but th- they, <laughs> what, what this all accomplishes is that sure. We're not posting pictures of the wine bottle. We don't even have one yet. Right. But they're building mm-hmm an audience and a community of people who are invested and they have great engagement. Absolutely. People love them. And, and now we are drawn into their story as viewers and we, we want to, we want to support them and we want to see them succeed. And that, now we're invested in, in much more than the bottle of wine. We're invested in them and we want to see, we want to see what happens next. And we'll likely Absolutely. buy the bottle of wine when it comes out. Totally. And it really makes you think of how much of these conversations about really creating your product are really about your product. Because the content that people are loving to see, yes, the product should be included at some point, but it's building this community and this lifestyle and all the content and visuals you put out speak to that. So mm-hmm. I, I love your answer to that question. I think that brings clarity for a lot of people just ready to get started. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we thank you so much for the in, in-depth insight on the day in the life of a brand strategist. I do appreciate you clarifying so many of these points because ultimately for most people, whether it's early founders or solopreneurs, they're trying to determine the best course for how to develop themselves authentically and and it needs to make sense financially ultimately. So to those of you listening, I Mm -hmm. hope this helps clarify some of your creative next steps, whether that's determining your visual voice or who you need to help determine that or who your next hire is or what your next degree might even be. Thank you so much for joining us on the visual commerce podcast. Thank you, Lisa. It's been, it's been fun. Hope we can do it again sometime. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.